It's fitting that today, November 19th, 2013, is actually the 150th anniversary of the Gettysburg Address. And that address by President Abraham Lincoln should be a reminder to all of us that you can say a lot of powerful things in two minutes. Even though we live in an electronic age, I think it's also a reminder of the power of speech communication and the importance of well-chosen words. Today you'll have an opportunity to watch that in action. Uh, welcome, my name is Marlene Cohen. I'm a professor of communication and debate and the coordinator of the International Education Center at Prince George's Community College. And I'm delighted to welcome you to the, very, to the 11th year of our annual British debate event. And also I'd like to thank the television production class of Prince George's Community College who, is them, who are themselves producing today's program. This program is sponsored by the International Education Center, the Honors Society, and the Department of Communication and Theater at Prince George's Community College, but it also wouldn't be possible without the support of the English-speaking union in Great Britain and the United States National Communication Association, which together provide an opportunity for students to travel the United States for the whole fall semester, visiting different colleges and universities and sharing their debate skills with us. The tour is a, pos is a great collaboration of our nations. Today I have the pleasure to introduce you to our two debaters. First, Nishé Aquil. Nishé was the best speaker at the English-speaking union's Pakistan, uh, at the English-speaking union of Pakistan's national public speaking competition in 2009, which meant she then went on to represent Pakistan in London at the international tournament in 2009. She was a member of the Pakistani national debating team who competed in the World Schools Debating Competition in Qatar in 2010, where she reached the quarterfinals. After graduating from University College Lahore in Pakistan in 2011 with a bachelor's in law with honors, she continued her legal story studies at the University of Kent. She was best speaker there at the first internal Kent debating competition in 2012. Following this, Nishay was, elect, was selected to represent the University of Kent at the Women, uh, Women Oxford Open and Imperial College. Nishay is very excited to be on this e uh, ESU American tour and got her first fleeting glimpse of the Capitol this morning, of the Capitol this morning as I whisked them away from Union Station. <laughs> Welcome, Nishay. Thank you. Charlie Morris graduated with a first class degree in history and politics from the University of Sheffield in England. His research interests include U.S. foreign policy in the Great Lakes region of Sub-Saharan Africa with and the study of the politics of development in Rwanda. During his time at university, he was an active member of the, Un of the um, United Kingdom debating circuit, winning several competitions and finishing as part of the top-breaking team at tournaments in London, Dublin, Paris, and Budapest. Char Charlie has been part of international speaking and coaching delegations uh, to Rwanda, Israel, Turkey, and coached Denmark's national debate team for the World Schools Debating Championships in South Africa. Don't these guys get great travel? <laughs> He currently mentors for the English Speaking Union and he's working now in India as a debate consultant for the Amity Education Group. We will be seeing a Lincoln Douglas format of debate today, one person versus one. We're back to Abraham Lincoln again. Uh, that allows each person equal time to present their, his or her case and then defend his or her case. There also will be an opportunity for direct question and answer. So I'm sure my speech students are looking forward to seeing how it's done. Following the debate, uh, we will have an opportunity for question and answers. Each side will do an eight minute constructive speech. There'll be three minutes for cross-examination after each speech and then a four minute rebuttal. And the topic that we have provided for the students is one that I think is still quite timely. This house believes that protection of national security must be a higher value than protection of personal privacy. I give you the debaters. <laughs> Thank you. 
Edward Snowden is an American hero. Now, I know what you're thinking. Uh, isn't that meant to be the argument for the other side? But actually, Edward Snowden is an American hero because he made us realize how little we care and how much we need these programs. When the information about the NSA surveillance was released, the American public and the UK public reacted with a collective shrug. And to those who didn't realize, are you serious? Like, if there's, this is the US federal government we're talking about, right? If there's one thing they're excellent at, it's legally dubious surveillance programs. <laughs> but we want to talk about this debate, because what this debate is about is a question of necessity. It's a question of, are these programs necessary to protect us, to protect our families and our loved ones? And do they, in that sense, do more harm than good? And those are the questions I want to ask in this debate today. I firstly want to talk about why these surveillance programs are absolutely necessary in the technologically advanced age that we live in. And I secondly want to talk about privacy and how the hyperbole that's come out about some of these programs. Now, let's be very clear. When we're talking about national security and privacy, there's always a trade-off between the two. You can never have both to their fullest extent. More privacy means less knowledge about what's going on, a greater unknown of what's going on. And of course, there should be limits. You wouldn't expect to have security cameras in everyone's home monitoring exactly what you are doing all of the time. That would be crazy. But what do you need? You do need a security apparatus that is able to rapidly detect and identify potential threats. Now, why is this the case? And what are we looking at in the world today? Because the threats that we face today are more complex and more difficult to detect than we could ever have possibly imagined even 20 years ago. People are able to use proxy servers to connect through chat rooms to be able to discuss potential plans. They're able to use dummy credit cards that go through multiple countries in order to purchase bomb making equipment. The point, therefore, is that technology has enabled people to become harder to detect and harder to detect what they're doing with these programs and specifically their planning and orientation of it. That, therefore, means that internet and technology has moved the world forward. So the question, therefore, in this debate is, should we have a security apparatus that moves along with the world? And remember, when we're talking about these threats, when we're talking about terrorism in particular, this is not just hyperbole. This is not just us standing up and saying there are potential things out there that, we're, that we don't know about. In June of 2013, the NSA released a sample of just some of the terror threats that had been presented. We saw in 2006, seven men had a detailed plan to blow up the Sears Tower. In 2007, a planned attack on Fort Dix in New Jersey. And in 2009, the underwear, uh, underwear bombers arrested on Christmas Day. The point, therefore, is that all of these threats together are ones which have been planned, uh, planned using a new technology which is even more difficult to detect than it was before. It's no longer good enough to have someone that's able to go snooping through rubbish bins. We need a comprehensive system that is able to detect these threats when we're facing things which we couldn't have possibly planned for bef uh, before. So let's talk about privacy, because it's quite clear that we do face p potential threats. So the question, therefore, is, is it worth the trade-off? Is this is something that we can adequately justify? Because what there has been recently is an incredible amount of scare tactics going on about exactly what's happening. And so it's useful to clear up some of the information about what's, go uh, what's going on. First of all, it's quite clear that the NSA is not spying on everyone. Right? It's just a matter of numbers for a start, that they simply can't. They don't have the manpower to be spying on everyone all of the time. That's why, for example, to authorize a direct wiretap, you still need court authorization. That's what the 2008 FISA laws were about that changed this from what had previously been the case with the Patriot Act in 2003. But the second obvious point is that the NSA doesn't care about the dirty text messages you're sending to your girlfriend. <laughs> what we saw with the PRISM program, for instance, was that PRISM operated on a risk calculus. 
They're not going to target you. They're not going to just directly monitor you if you simply just type bomb into Google. Sure, if you type how to bomb make a New York subway, maybe you might get a few people coming knocking at your door. But the point is, this is a, a system which doesn't just isolate you as individuals. It operates on a holistic basis, which tries to gain as much information as possible about you and the actions that you're taking in order to detect whether you might be a threat to those around you in future. But it's important as well to clarify that this is not simply about the security of the past. We're not talking about McCarthyism or J. Edgar Hoover, where people are put into random interrogation rooms and whisked away without anyone notifying. The new security in particular has become about a system of indirect surveillance. Now, let's be very clear about what indirect surveillance means. Indirect surveillance means automated computer programs run by machines monitor the phone calls that you make, the messages, and the purchases that you, that you make in particular. Note, at no point there is there direct human intervention. This is done by machines, right? These are machines that are able to automatically detect exactly what's happening. What does that mean? It means a lot of the things are actually better than the old days of what we used to have. It doesn't require some shady CIA agent to break into your house and search for it because it's an automated program that does it without regard to who you are as an individual and it's able to detect you purely on the actions that you take and the messages that you send looking for certain code words. And that's the new security that we're talking about. And what a lot of the debate in the media has lost today is that nuance. It's lost the nuance that this is not directly someone opening your emails and reading all of the things that you, you have done. These are automated programs which operate on a risk calculus that are neutral in that regard. But when we come on to uh, privacy, therefore, it clouds a lot of the debate because the entire debate about privacy is about something that makes us feel nervous. Something that makes us feel a bit uncomfortable when we know that someone might be reading our emails. But the point about the new security, there, therefore, is it's actually better than what it used to be. It's actually neutral. It's actually objective. It's actually something that's able to monitor the largest amount of information possible and able to gain a broadest picture. That means the new security doesn't operate off some kind of like subjective grounds of you know what your name is or what some individual detective feels is important. These are huge information monitoring programs which are able to automatically detect. And so when we're talking about privacy, therefore, we need to acknowledge this fact. We need to acknowledge that we're dealing with a, uh, a system which is different to what it used to be. And the question, therefore, is, is this the appropriate measure to take in front of the new face th threats that we face? And to this side, we say, absolutely. Thank you. Um, for the cross-sex. So it's interesting that you say that people reacted with a shrug when they found out that their own governments were spying on them. Do, do you think that there was any kind of grievance on the part of the citizens of the US or the UK? I think there was a particular grievance, but that grievance was because people misunderstood the type of surveillance systems that were happening. They thought it was NSA agents always reading their emails and exactly what they do without any kind of authorization. But the point is, it's not been like that. It's actually been a system where you do have to seek direct court authorization if you are to read particular emails, and you do, can't just monitor people because you feel like it. So what kind of courts are we really talking about? So you're talking about courts that operate on a very, uh, various different level for, uh, uh, for depending on what type of authorization you'd like. If you simply want to re uh, read someone's emails, it requires a letter, uh, lesser authorization from particular internal agents. If you want to wiretap entirely someone's house and install like cameras in there, probably needs a greater measure of authorization. So basically, the US Foreign Intelligence Court, which happens to be a secret court, one that is not open to public discourse, not open to public ideas. So basically, you're saying that even though you're spying on the public, the public has no way of accounting for it. So here's a question that goes in back. 
How effective would a court that is discussing issues of secret surveillance be if that court was open? See, that makes me frightened because your uh, entire idea is that you have surveillance, but there's still checks and balances in the form of courts. So there's some form of accountability and transparency, which means that people should not be scared. But then when you ask me that question, it's more of like, it needs to be more secret. Right, but that's exactly what's happened. What you can do is, from the findings of these courts, you can audit them and check what's going on. But it would be crazy to suggest that these courts should be an open process where we discuss every surveillance system that's happening, because that would probably lessen the effectiveness of those surveillance programs, right? All right, moving on, um, you talked about this neutrality of um, surveillance. Would you mind just expanding on that a little more so we get a clearer idea? Sure. I think the good thing about, about the new surveillance systems is that they're large machine-operated op systems which analyze big data. So they're analyzing millions of messages, millions of phone calls of lots and lots of people. They're not just therefore based on an individual agent's perception about what's going on, which makes them more objectively able to analyze the situation. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, of course this is a debate about balances, whether one is better or more valuable than the other, whether personal privacy should be given more weightage than security. But of course this big question, this normative debate needs to have some kind of footing in the real world. And that is why I asked my friend here about what exactly is the nature of surveillance? What exactly is this idea of neutrality, of spying? And it's interesting what we got out of his speech. Because he said, look, it doesn't really matter if you type in bomb somewhere. But you know what raises bells? It's when you say how to make one. And then you insert a more sinister location where it's flooded by innocent civilians. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it sounds plausible, right? Absolutely plausible. People are doing this. People are searching for information. They, they Google it. But now, don't imagine one individual or two. Imagine the millions of people in the United States of America, millions of people in the United Kingdom, billions all over, right? So what you have is metadata, a term that is called or that is used to describe data about data. Now this is confusing and this confuses me as well. So let's break it down. It's basically, ladies and gentlemen, just billions and billions of bits of data. Now what that means is that it is incredibly hard to then sift through that information in order to have some kind of valuable information as to who it is that you're targeting, where it is that he or she is operating from, where exactly will they strike, who are they working with, who is their commander, and what do we do? Now, that's incredibly sophisticated, incredibly hard. And to that, my friend here said, you know what, it is hard, but we can do that with more manpower. And the question is, ladies and gentlemen, how much more? Because if you analyze the nature of the threat itself, that requires what? Speed, right? because you want to be there before the bomb explodes. That is the general idea of security. That is the general idea of spying on each and every citizen of the United States of America and the United Kingdom and the world over. So then my question is, ladies and gentlemen, of the efficacy of the project itself. If it does not work, then should we ask a bigger question of why it is that we need to discuss this question over and over again because you know what when Charlie says that people reacted with a shrug as to oh governments you know what they spy on us all the time something has gone terribly wrong ladies and gentlemen when people are not caring and I think that's not really true because people are always frightened people are very paranoid it's where your mobile services, your Wi-Fi providers, anybody and everybody involved in the system of communicating, of connecting people, are now under the surveillance or under the scope of the government itself. And this brings me to my three basic questions, ladies and gentlemen. Why exactly is it a dangerous notion? And within this, I'm talking to you about two things. One, the standard of relevance with which you are allowed authorization 
to spy on people. The second one, the system of accountability and transparency and why it is essential to any state, particularly one that prides itself as the champion of democratic sensibilities and liberties. And finally, I'm going to talk to you about this normative idea of why it is essential that each and every individual feel safe and secure knowing that what they do in the private space of their home, school, universities, so on and so forth, is not being read by their government, ladies and gentlemen. You know what? When we say the government needs to stay out of our bedrooms, damn it, we mean it. So the first one, ladies and gentlemen, this idea of it's a dangerous notion when you allow the government to spy on its people. And the first one, ladies and gentlemen, that I'm going to talk to you about is how the standard of for accepting the relevance of collecting information has become very low. Because the second any agency or the executive invokes the words terrorism, global th threat, you know what, they're out there, that is enough. We think, ladies and gentlemen, something has gone terribly wrong. When such big meta-narratives are used to institute policies that are not only used to identify threats elsewhere, but now they're creating threats within your own people. Now you have made an enemy out of your own citizens, ones that you vowed to protect, ladies and gentlemen. That's wrong, right? But the second one, ladies and gentlemen, is this idea of how much leeway you give to the executive. How much more are you willing to give up for this elusive idea of security? Because I'm not sure how many people feel secure not knowing where the threat is coming from, how many attacks have been fended off, or whether or not your neighbor is somebody you need to be scared about. Because now these are the ideas that surround us, something that we become desensitized to. That in itself is a problem. But the second one, ladies and gentlemen, and this is a report that came out just yesterday. It's where the director of national intelligence releases the original script of the court order that, yes, allowed the NSA to spy on people. But what was the nature of this report? Because what this said was, you can so on, so forth as you know the addresses of the people who are operating, that's fine. But never did it say that you can read the content. We think, ladies and gentlemen, that in itself shows the limited capability of the court. But what exactly is this court? And this is the question that I asked Charlie, because this is immensely important. Courts have always been at the cornerstone of protecting freedoms because that is the check that you have on the executive. But if this court is a secret court, then what good does it to the public who are, number one, the stakeholders in this debate in this time, ladies and gentlemen? We think that not only is it a secret court, it is closed to the public. Though proceedings are recorded, you will never hear of them unless Edward Snowden tells you that something has happened or if, you know what, he tweets about it much like Kim Kardashian does. Who wouldn't want that? And so I ask you, ladies and gentlemen, if it relates to you, don't you have a right then to know what the government does with the information that it has? Because it's easy to just use the denominator of, oh, the government doesn't really care about what kind of dirty texts you send to your, f to your girlfriend or your boyfriend. But the concept is greater than that. It is bigger than that. And that is what I pose it to you today. Because ladies and gentlemen, what I'm going to tell you is that in the world of today, when you have these two values, you need to assess them on their own merits as much as you need to do in the context of the real world. Security has always been a reactionary value, one that develops when you think that liberties are under attack. Liberty, ladies and gentlemen, freedom, privacy, have always been the cornerstones of any society that prides itself in thinking that we are a civilized society. One that says that when we create the government, when we move away from this Hobbesian idea of the Leviathan, this big, scary executive leader standing there monitoring everybody and then doing away with people they thought were threats, we moved away from that, right? We moved away from that kind of narrative when we said we don't want that kind of imposition of power, that kind of a government. We wanted more involvement. We wanted more information. And we wanted more security, not from external threats, but the big internal one that's staring us right in the face. Ladies and gentlemen, it's not your neighbor. Today, it's the government. Thank you. So you discussed a lot of the time the terrorist threats we're, we're facing now. 
Would you say that terrorist threats have got significantly more advanced in the past decade? Yes, they have, which means that they're not really using their email addresses. They're hiding in caves where there is no such signal. And so if you're saying that you will use more surveillance, then I suggest that if they become smarter, then the efficacy of the program fails entirely. But we're not really worried about those hiding in caves because they're the ones that aren't in the United States. So the ones that are in the United States that probably do have access to a computer, how do we detect those? First of all, ladies and gentlemen, I posit to you this. As time progresses, technology becomes, you know, what's smarter, and so do individuals who want to use them. So if they're becoming smarter and they are a threat, and I don't deny that there are threats, but if they are using technology in a smarter way and if the government is unable to get them, would you then suggest that the project as it operates today and as it expects to continue would be somewhat obsolete? But isn't then the consequence of that that security should advance to match those rather than just lag behind and give up? And that's exactly what I wanted you to say because then my question is what is the limit? Because the threat will continue to exist as long as you have people who want to harm the interests of the US. Right, but it's advancing in a way that's actually better because the whole point of this debate is that the new types of security that we're talking about isn't everyone reading your emails, it's detection systems that are able to analyze risk. So you do agree that you are then spying on a whole lot of people, collecting a lot of information, and then sifting through to make connections. How often do you think that works out for the government? Well, the NSA released this year detailed records of over 50 advanced stage terror attacks in the past 10 years. So I guess my question then is, how many of those would you have allowed to happen in the name of privacy? Before I answer that, I would ask, do we, uh, are we really sure that those happened? Because we can't really account for that, because there is no process of transparency or accountability. Right, but these were released in a House Intelligence Committee where the records were thoroughly audited by all of the members of that uh, committee as to what exactly happened. So if you're not talking about that accountability, what accountability are you talking about? See, that kind of accountability is scary in itself because the accountability when you say happens is secret quotes is um, released in these meetings whereby people do not really have a form of questioning them. That is scary in itself. But if you ask me that threats exist, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say yes, they do. And if the answer is that they're going to continue to exist, the answer is yes in itself. But then my question is, will the government then allow this to persist? It will get even harsher. And so it's not just about then the email addresses and content, but something which is much more sinister. Right, but then you talked about the secret courts. So the question is, would you allow the proceedings of the secret courts to be open? Absolutely. If they're open, if they're greater checks and transparency, if people can question them, air the grievances, and then have their say in shutting the programs down if they so wish, then that is a step forward. Will it happen? I don't think so. That's why we're having the debate. Great. Thank you. Thanks. So I think there are two broad questions in this debate that we have to ask. The first thing we have to ask is, what are the kind of security threats we face at the moment? And are these programs really necessary to protect against them? And the second question we have to ask is, what are the accountability mechanisms over these types of security programs? And do the public have a right to say in the types of monitoring that occurs? So first of all, let's talk about the security threats. because. One of the main questions that we've heard on the, heard by the opposing speaker is that actually these programs aren't really that, ne that necessary, right? Terrorists are really smart. They're hiding in caves. They don't really use emails and stuff like that. Um, I posit to you that terrorists do probably use the internet. They do probably use phone calls. Otherwise, they'd be incredibly ineffective at what they do. But what they do is they don't just simply use emails or phone calls. They use proxy servers in order to hide their IP addresses. They route phone calls through a number of countries, which makes it difficult to detect where exactly that phone call is coming from. Obviously, they don't just go onto Gmail and send a message going, hey, buddy, are we bombing the Golden Gate Bridge here on this day? That's obviously not what they do. But what they do is they're smart. They're clever. And that means in order to match against them, we need a security apparatus and detection systems which are able to follow those, cha uh, those chain of messages, that are able to follow that routing, that are able to detect a number of messages from similar sources, from similar IP addresses in similar areas. And that's the whole point of this debate. The whole point is whether security systems should be able to match the new types of technology that we're using. 
And so therefore, when it comes to analyzing the terrorist threats, I think we kind of were, were a bit undersold exactly what's going on because we heard, well, there aren't that really many threats. You know, we've had a few things, but it hasn't really been that important. We say a lot of those threats are probably ones that we've never even heard of, that are simultaneously detected, and then people have, uh, are confiscated and put in jail for conspiracy to bombing. Right? That happens quite a lot. But actually, we heard detailed accounts this year at a House Intelligence Committee hearing that I talked about in my cross-examination, where the NSA released Co release comprehensive details of security threats of over 50 that they had stopped. And these threats are ones that we hear about. We heard about the bombing in 2006 or the planned bombing of the Sears Tower. We heard about the planned bombing of Fort Dix. We heard about planned bombings of the New York Stock Exchange and the subway system. And we heard about the Nigerian Christmas Day bomber. These are all things which do actually occur. They're not just made up. And so when this side says that it's hyperbole, you know, there's this vague idea of security. This is a very, very real idea of security. It's not just some, uh, something that's, you know, up in the air and an idea we're discussing. These are actual threats and actual things that have been prevented to which we can look to. So the question, therefore, is how can we make them accountable? Now, what we had in 2008 are a series of laws passed that change how we monitor surveillance systems. And we pass laws all the time that dictate how these are done. The House Intelligence Committee is able to hold hearings and make them public when they so, uh, they so wish and view it as essential to public knowledge on when we can change these programs. But the craziest thing we heard, and this is what I really wanted to ask, is the opposing idea coming from Niche was that we should make the hearings of secret courts where we discuss surveillance programs public. I think it's fairly apparent that if we make these proceedings public, they will be less effective because people know when they're being surveilled, right? What these courts do is they're able to authorize particular wiretaps. Those wiretaps aren't going to be effective if people know they're being tapped. And so it's, a, again, a question of trade-off, a question of do you prefer your security and your freedom to live, your freedom to security, or your freedom to privacy? And we say you should balance it on this side. Thank you. After all of this, I think, I think to myself, wouldn't it be nice if terrorists used Facebook or tweeted as much as Miley Cyrus? But alas, that is not the situation, is it? And so you need to resort to sophisticated means of fishing them out of millions of people. Ladies and gentlemen, this debate is about two questions broadly. The first one, does the public at any point in time consent to being massively surveilled by the government? And the second one is this idea of how far will the people allow their government to go for this promised elusive idea of security? So the first one, ladies and gentlemen, and this is important, because whenever a nation comes together and has an instituted power, a government, there is this underlying understanding, an idea of we give up certain liberties in exchange for a promise of security, where we promise that not each individual will judge situations by their own morality and sense of right and wrong. That right is given up to the government. So is the right to defend yourself by organizing yourselves into a militia, for example. It doesn't happen here, but that is broadly the idea, isn't it? But I ask you this, ladies and gentlemen, at any point in time, did you envision that it would come to this? Where now the government really doesn't ask for permission. It says we can because we must. Surely, ladies and gentlemen, there is something wrong with that. Surely there is something dangerous or sinister because governments have done this before. This is not a new narrative coming out of a powerful executive that is now not just a representative of the people, but has called itself the guardian of the people by somehow telling us about this idea that a threat exists. Surely a threat does, ladies and gentlemen. The threat has always existed, but you and I all know that it is used and manipulated for number one, campaigns, number two, invasions, number three, securing more power. 
that is why we have checks and balances on governments because we fear that the government will just go too far. When I say that you have secret courts, one that are as on a parallel to the Supreme Court of the United States of America, I ask you, does that transparency really exist? Because if we are to affirm, if we are to question the nature of the threats, the number of the threats, the people involved in those threats, whether they have been convicted rightly, whether they had trials, whether the information that was used in order to get them was channeled through torture or so on and so forth, I ask you, do you have or are you privy to that information? The answer is no. Do you care? That is the question. Because if people have stopped caring, that is where we lose this debate and we lose this battle generally. But ladies and gentlemen, what I really want to ask you is about this narrative that the government spins and the narrative we have become a part of. Because if we are to accept that there have always been threats to liberties and securities, then what has been the answer? Has it been a more closer society where the governments have instituted, instituted policies that discriminate not only against people of other states, but also within your own nation? Where they divide you into these barriers and into these um, little taglines, because that happens within the system. That is exactly what Charlie is talking about. The use of certain words, what you look like, where you come from, who you're talking to, all of these forms of association suddenly become weapons that the government uses. But ladies and gentlemen, the last point, because in this world I understand that a balance needs to be struck and I ask you how far will you let that go? Because when we are born we understand that freedoms are free. But unfortunately the space in which we exercise them is not. And the only way we can guard our liberties from being taken away is to patrol them continuously and fiercely. Thank you. <laughs> sure. Thank you so thank you so much for a wonderful debate. Don't you think they did a very good job of articulating the issues? If you wouldn't mind bringing in the microphone while we have a chance for the audience to make comments or ask questions. So we'd be happy to hear from you. We'd just like you to talk into the microphone if you would. Don't be shy. <laughs> sure. Um, my question is for you. Um, I want to know, like, what restrictions or reformations you would think should be made on national security to protect people's privacy? I think in any point in time, since we are all, always talking about a balance, I understand that there will be some form of surveillance that is on the people. But I suggest that the checks and balances, the first step would be moving away from this idea of super secrecy that exists not only within the processes but within the court system itself. So essentially what you have is an entire system unto itself under the NSA or the FBI or the CIA. We think that when you bring that or bring some of it in, uh, into light, when you do publish their reports, when you do publish the court orders, when you are able to question what kind of thresholds exist or the, the levels that exist that allow governments or these agencies to then surveil people, we think that is a step forward and that is the kind of trend um, we should be edging towards. Um, I have a question for you. Don't you think uh, revealing a secret court would be counterproductive? See, that's the number argument one. you want. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for making a case for Charlie. <laughs> um, yes, in some sense, yes. But the question is, when do these court orders really take place? Because the court order doesn't really talk about, oh, this is the individual we're talking about. This is the nature of the threat. More often than not, court orders discuss the kind of powers that are granted to agencies, which is broadly in terms of what, what kind of people can you 
have surveillance on? What methods can you use? What kind of information can you use? Can you read the content? Can you have access to their content? So on and so forth. So more often than not, it doesn't relate to particulars about individuals or about particular threats happening at that point in time. Rather, it's discussing the extent of power of those policies. I think those will not be counterproductive to any secret mission that is happening or hamper a threat from being counted at the point in time. The basic idea is the scope of powers that are being discussed, the tug of war between the courts and these agencies and the executive. That is the kind of policy that people need to have access to and people start need to question. But I thank you for your question. It, it is very I, pertinent. I think Charlie should be entitled to respond to that sure. as well. <laughs> um, I think the I, th I think the I think the thing that Nietzsche is saying about like, like what do like these courts define the scope of that? Uh, it's not these courts that define the scope of that. What defines the scope and the parameters of what individual agencies can do are laws, things like the Patriot Act and the FISA Act in 2008. Those are the things that things that outline what exactly you need to do in order to seek your authorization. The reason why these courts are secret, therefore, is because what we're actually discussing in them are individual surveillance programs that the NSA and the CIA and the FBI are trying to seek authorization for. The point is, they can't make them open because if they were to make them open, people would realize pretty quickly that they're being surveilled and wouldn't use that phone that they are, they're using now to get that. You, of course, need to make certain courts secret. So when we have the open debate, the open debate should incur over the discussion of the laws. The Patriot Act wasn't secret. Everyone knew about the Patriot Act. Everyone knew exactly what it authorized. We can have a discussion about security. We just can't have a discussion about the individual details of it because it would make it pretty un ineffective. Um, this is a question for either of you guys. Um, how do you feel about America spying on um, world leaders and not respecting their privacy, such as the French president? <laughs> <laughs> I think I can take it first. Um, I think, I mean, I think it, I think it's one of the one of those things where there's been a lot of outrage as to exactly what's happening. People have come out, come out in uproar. Um, and it's like, you know, if, you, if you're a world leader and, you know, you don't realize that the U.S. government is spying on you, then what are you doing? <laughs> um, I, think it's, I think it's probably wrong overall that we spy on our allies. I think particularly people like France, like Germany, we can probably trust with their own internal surveillance programs. Particularly, and I think this is probably where you make the distinction, when there's intelligence sharing between two countries. To the point at which you're trusting these people with classified information, you probably don't need to surveil those leaders and tap their phones. So I'd probably say you can make some sort of distinction there. Um, what I would say to that comment is, um, when it was found out through reports that had been released by Edward Snowden, the idea was that not that you stop having surveillance on these leaders, rather don't get caught. And that is the problem I have with the narrative um, in general because, uh, and I agree with what Charlie has said, when you have um, allies, particularly when you're dealing with sensitive information, there is intelligence exchange, um, there is less need to, be, to have spying because one, it creates mistrust between those two parties, but generally you have again this idea of um, agencies operating within the government that do not really fall under the scope of, um, of any kind um, of, of check and balance. And if I can go back, um, and talk, I, I know I'm being a little unfair, talk a little bit, a bit about the um, uh, Patriot Act, so on and so forth. Legislation in itself has lots of nuances and you never really know the full scope until there are cases that relate to the use of the law itself. So to say that the law is something that is visible um, means nothing um, until you know what it means or what kind of ends it's being used for. And so I think that's more important. Also, you need these courts because it's not just the operation of the law, but also how these executive orders um, operate. And that is why I think that there needs to be greater check and balances. Sorry for um, moving a bit, a bit away from the um, question at hand. Uh, we did not allow the audience a chance to vote. Forgive me. Before we do any more questions, I would like to do that. So I want you to think about where you would uh, put the higher value. Would you vote in, in terms of national security? being a higher value than personal privacy or the reverse. So let me ask first those who would vote believing that national security is a higher value and voting for Charlie. May I see a show of hands? All right. And those who would vote for protection of private pri uh, privacy and vote for Nietzsche. 
It's very I've got close. one behind the camera. Oh, yeah, you've got a cameraman on your side. I think it goes to Charlie, yes. but I think it's quite close, isn't it? <laughs> Good you. for you for having Thank such a balance you. today. <laughs> Other questions that you would like to ask about this subject? Sure. Hello. Uh, my question is for Charlie. I understand that to a certain extent uh, national security is important, but I also believe that power can corrupt people. So mm -hmm. my question would be what um, restrictions or who's watching the people that are in charge of these organizations, NSA, FBI, uh, CIA, the people who are in charge, what's to stop um, people from being corrupted and using that power for their own personal interests and gain uh, you know, besides national security matters? Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a great question. <laughs> now the vote is done, I can talk about whatever I want. <laughs> no, seriously. Um, I, think the, I, I, think, I, I think the thing is that coming up with accountability mechanisms for organizations which essentially have to operate in secret is very difficult. Um, I think some of the things that have come out have been uh, li like you can have like a grand jury investigations which are secret over particular things. You can have... Uh, House Intelligence Committee hearings, which are confidential until certain inf uh, information is released. You can require by law some kind of measure, measure of oversight, which means that you have to seek authorization within particular things. And I think, I think the way to the way to imagine it, um, and the way I certainly imagine it, is that within these organisations, it's it's not as though you have just one individual people that, that you know. Pay, people that operate in isolation where there's no check over. These are large organizations with a hierarchy and accountability. And ultimately, the most visible people are those at the top. They're the, one, they're the ones that ultimately the buck stops there. So there is some measure of accountability because at the end of the day, these people don't want to be fired, which they're likely to do if this information get, gets out. So I think they are organizations which do have some measure of oversight. Granted, it's not as much as it uh, as perhaps it should be or could be, but ultimately, I think it's what is necessary. Other thoughts you have about oversight that would be helpful? I think this is a tricky match again. Something that has been talking about and time and again. Though the ones at the top are the most visible, there is not really a lot of legislation or any kind of internal mechanism that stops them from going. Um, over the fence about certain situations. Though it is right that certain mechanisms exist, but th those are number one internal to the um, organization itself. And if they're internal, then they have their own courts, they have their own people judging them by the standard that has been by, by set by them. So I think it is a very convoluted system that does little for transparency. Thanks. And I think that, uh, uh, just on that as well, I think one of, the, one of the most misunderstood things about the Edward Snowden case was that Edward Snowden rele uh, released his information and then like the government persecuted him because he was releasing information of all about these security programs. It's not true. Like there are whistleblowing like structures within place in the NSA and the CIA we, uh, by which you can release information. But the point about Edward Snowden was that he didn't go through these me these mechanisms. Mm -hmm. He just phoned up the Guardian and went, "Hey, I've got a load of uh, like information about this. Want it?" Um, and I think that, that that's the key point. So I think we should have good whistleblowing programs for when mm -hmm. there are situations which you know accountability mechanisms can't deal with, but people shouldn't just go and leak information to the media just because they want to become popular. Other questions on the subject? Actually, Charlie, you've uh, caused me to have two questions. Um, one of, uh, to your immediate remark, one of the things that the Obama administration has been doing is using the Espionage Act more often than any president's for all the years that the Espionage Act has existed. So can you comment on how the whistleblowing process is secure when the government is increasingly aggressive toward uh, people who do blow whistles? Um, yeah, I think, it's, I think it's increasingly becoming a widely recognized fact that perhaps the Obama administration isn't quite as open about a lot of the a lot of the things that happen in their government as you know their lovely blue pictures on whitehouse.gov would love to have you believe um, 
I think I'd say that to the extent that which they're using, particularly things like the Espionage Act, also things um, like uh, executive privilege to cover certain documents, of, uh, as in the case that they did in Fast and Furious, I think that's wrong. Um, I don't think they, they should do that. And they should have open discussions about programs where they, where they won't threaten na national security. So if by releasing information that does threaten national security, I think it's legitimate to cover that information up. But to the extent of which they're unjustly, aggressively u using that to shut out political criticism, I don't think that's OK. That's, of course, something that shouldn't happen. Did you want to ask a second question? <laughs> <laughs> if we look, uh, going back, say, to the end of World War II and uh, the beginning of the Cold War, the need for classification of information has grown and grown and grown, and this and the justification for this, of course, is that uh, we must be secure. And to the extent, to that extent, we've we've had plenty of revelations about our government classifying just about anything, and uh, and now we continue to have this argument about the need for uh, more secrecy, more. Where, uh, in other words, where do we see this process ending? This is one of the arguments I think you made. There, it's, it seems to be open-ended, and if we look back a long way, do you have any comments to make on that? Um, I think I, I think I guess there's kind of two areas. Then I think the first area is saying that in an age where there is simply more communication and more complex forms of communication, it's only necessary that like look like in a, as in, in quantifiable terms, more information will need to be classified because things aren't as simple, diplomatic relations aren't simple as, you know, one agent going and meeting another and like talking in code words. That's not what like diplomacy is about now. So I think like there is and perhaps rightfully an increasing trend of information being classified. Mm -hmm. To the extent that it's something that has been, you know, starting you know, starting with Hoover, increasing through the Cold War and perhaps not ending. I'm I'm not necessarily sure I agree that it's an open-ended thing that will always be increasing because I think it is something that's dependent on certain administrations and their particular policies over what needs to be uh, like what needs to be classified what they view as needing to be classified. I think that's different to analyze purely because you have like quite a small sample size of precedent since the end of the Cold War. Um, but again, something which I think is an interesting topic to look at. Um, I mean, I would disagree. The idea that a government can keep it as open-ended as they have been is um, a weapon in their um, armory because that is their go-to narrative. When anything happens and they want to get something passed really quickly, rather expediently, um, going over any kind of form of, mech of, of check or balance, they'll say, you know what, we have threats and we need to do it now. That's how the Patriot Act was passed in, in record time. Um, and, uh, and similar legislation in the UK and the US that took away liberties that you know the, the US um, Constitution and the US nation was found on. And that's my question for today. That's my question that has been throughout and will be for the ages. It's at what point do you really stop? Because if that, and if you recognize that's the go-to story of the government, something that they've been using and exploiting for quite some time, then it, it won't stop. I don't think it would. It would just get more sinister, something that nobody would really know about, given this um, idea of secrecy that we guard um, rather closely, which is uh, rather disturbing. Thank you. We're going to transition our conversation now, because I think it's a great opportunity to ask two visitors who've been traveling through the United States for two months. Is that correct, at this point? Just a little one over one and a half months. Over one Don't and a mind. half months, and they've been to 25 schools because I would say the National Communication Association <laughs> is keeping you quite busy this <laughs> year. So I think it's an interesting opportunity for us to ask some questions about the perspective of people from the UK and from Pakistan about what they're seeing uh, in their travels. Yeah. So I'd like to lead that off, and you're welcome to add <coughs> other questions to that. I want to pose the questions of, what were the things that have stood stood out for you in your visit as perhaps, you know, wow, I just wouldn't see this back home? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I mean, <laughs> the, I the portions. Yeah. Let's I start with the basics now. Yeah, <laughs> I think I think the the biggest <laughs> example is like food. The f you have the to, food. You have to explain it. The food. I mean, the portions are enormous. You need to understand. When I first <laughs> saw my steak, I thought it was for everybody on the table. <laughs> it was. It couldn't possibly be for me. And then the idea of having your drinks being refilled. That was an anomaly. I was just like. Why would you do that? That was just interesting. Um, like, I don't have to pay for this again. Um, so that is one of the basic things. But on a more profound note, something that has been um, really important, and Charlie and I often discuss this, whenever you're going to a, a particular country, you know that people are going to be different. It's not going to be the same as you've heard. But the contrast has been so stark, particularly when you go from state to state or even different regions within a state. Everybody's idea of what the American life is and what it means to be American is so different and it's <laughs> so interesting because it's, you, you get this widespread of people and it's just also the, um, the, the warmth with which um, we've been entertained um, and just their spirit of wanting us, wanting to show us the best. Um, I think it was just, it's, it has been overwhelming. It's just overwhelming all the time. It's tiring. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else you'd like to add? Um, I mean, I can I can safely say that you know France has tried to compete somewhat, but there's there's nothing like Disneyland. <laughs> um, <laughs> that was that was absolutely Quite extraordinary. So. <laughs> that was what wonderful. That's a very surprising comment. <laughs> it was it, it was great. They uh, we we had one of the one of the schools in California who messaged us saying you know we. We're not sure whether you're you're too old or whatever, but do you, do you want to go to Disneyland? And we were like, of course we want to go to Disneyland. <laughs>